Hello and welcome to the Stock Out. Hope everyone's having a good uh, Monday. I'm Mike Bowden, just on the head of Intermodal Solutions here at Freight Waves. And the Stock Out is your show at Freight Waves about all things related to the consumer packaged goods or CPG industry. So that's one of the big uh, um, industries where um, that, that moves uh, freight. So it accounts for about one fifth of all freight transportation. And today on the Stock Out, I'm going to go through the CPG news, and then I'll talk about some of the highlights we're seeing uh, in Sonar as we um, head right to the beginning of the traditional fall uh, peak season. And I'll explain why maybe the fall peak season might be muted or might not have much of a, a fall peak season at all. So I'll talk about those things. Um, but first, uh, I'd like to thank our sponsor, which is RJW Logistics Group. RJW owns and operates every step of the middle mile. As an asset-based integrated logistics company, they offer a full suite of retail supply chain solutions under one roof, including industry-leading retail consolidation that consistently delivers over 98% on time and in full month after month to many retailers. RJW's programs offer global suppliers control and transparency, helping them improve in-stocks, achieve retail retailer compliance, grow market share, and increase sales. Visit rjwgroup.com to optimize your supply chain today. So <clears throat> a big thanks to, thanks to RJW Logistics Group for sponsoring the show. If you want to hear more from them directly, did have their CEO, Kevin Williamson, on the uh, show, uh, I want to say, about three weeks ago. Um, and they went through a lot of the sort of the unique uh, offerings that they uh, provide. Um, so with that, I'd like to get into the CPG news. So sort of the first topic here is... Uh, the Beyond Meat, um, you know, nose bite that you probably you know read about, uh, just one of many problems. You probably uh, you know read about this about a week and a half ago uh, at the University of Arkansas football game. Uh, company COO Doug Ramsey apparently someone dinged his car. He got into a fight, threatened to kill, and bit the nose off another uh, of another motorist. Uh, about two, at least two of those three things are illegal, and he was arrested and um, has been suspended. From his company, Beyond Meat, um, issued a two-sentence uh, press release. Um, they have someone else now, a VP of Operations, is is in his uh, role. And um, you know, I think there were a lot of sort of, uh, <clears throat> sort of humorous comments about this. I have one tweet that I, that I plucked in particular. Um, if we can put that on the screen, you know, Beyond Meat COO arrested for biting a man's nose once again, proving you can't beat the real thing. I think that most of it's a company that, that manufactures uh, you know, plant-based meat alternatives. I think a lot of the jokes were around that nature, and um, you know, sort of brought it Beyond Meat to, to people's attention again. And you know, it was, it was interesting because Beyond Meat was one of the companies that I started uh, writing about. You know, when I started, uh, when I took over the the stock out as kind of a, a side hustle at, at Freight Waves about a year and a half ago. And at the time, the company was still flying high. It was kind of wanted to, to touch on one of the um, trends that could potentially have a big impact in uh, food supply chains and could really potentially be disruptive in, in, in food supply chains. And I still think ultimately it could, you know, uh, there's so much focus on, you know, environmental uh, sustainability. So going from, you know, animal-based protein to a, a plant-based protein or even things that are even higher tech than that, like vertical farming or cell-based meat, you know, could potentially have a big uh, impact on food supply chain. So I wanted to cover those things um, but, you know, with Beyond Meat, and I think it's really kind of a category problem, a lot of those um, that promise didn't materialize, it, it, at least not yet. Uh, Beyond Meat, I think they rolled out too many products too quickly. Um, they actually tasted the Beyond sausage, thought it was really uh, bad, um, you know, a lot worse than uh, the Beyond uh, Burger, and seemed to be the wrong strategy, too. You know, Beyond went after all these fast food restaurants, not clear if there was much overlap between the clientele that wants a plant-based meat alternative, which tends to be the higher income millennials that are um, you know, focused on environment and, and not at a lot of overlap there between you know, the, sort of the traditional sort of fast food uh, customers. Um, and there's also just the competition has really uh, been you know, proliferated here. A lot of the traditional meat-based companies, you think of companies like Tyson, have rolled out their competing lines of plant-based you know, meat alternatives, um, just kind of as a hedge, at least it looked like initially, you know, not knowing how much share those plant-based meat uh, companies were going were gonna to offer. So um, really, it seems like it was almost a category issue of it being oversaturated, heard from other companies that, um, you know, their sales haven't materialized either, like uh, Maple Leaf Foods 
is a big food company that has a, a plant-based um, segment, and they said the segment there has been disappointing. They've seen slowing growth rates. Also, that kind of mirror what um, you know the the slowing growth rates that Beyond Meat has had. And I think part of what's going into this is these plant-based products, um, you know, like the Beyond Burger, like the Impossible Burger. They're starting to lose their halo, where the sentiment has sort of changed from this is healthier to this is really processed. This has a lot of chemicals in it. You know, you know some of these um, ingredients, um, you know, are just maybe too complicated. If the if the label uh, has a lot of ingredients that you know you don't recognize, maybe it's not something that you should be eating. So I think a lot of people now think, you know, some of these uh, you know alternatives are maybe less healthy than the original. And and I think some of the um, you know alternative companies, like you think of Oatly you know, was accused of greenwashing. So maybe it really doesn't have the environmental benefit that these companies claim either. So there's been all of these, um, you know, issues in terms of the sentiment changing, uh, you know, beyond meets market cap, you know, went from a peak of about 14 billion to now it's about 1 billion. And that was more than enough to de- delay the impossible uh, foods IPO. It looked like um, in 2021 that an impossible foods IPO was imminent. Now it's kind of nowhere to be seen. And, um, you know, part of that also is the IPOs recently really haven't, haven't worked out. I mean, most of the ones that have, have gone public the last couple of years are, um, you know, pretty severely, uh, you know, underwater. So I think you're going to see fewer IPOs overall and not expecting to see that, that impossible IPO anytime uh, soon. Also saw the news on the same, you know, category that the very good food company, which is a company that also makes um, it's kind of a, an alternative for a butcher uh, plant based, and they do it based on on, on beans uh, primarily. That company is 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 up for sale as well. Um, I think the splitting of Kellogg into three um, you know segments. One of those is a plant based segment. Could also be related to just you know a, a reassessment of the value of sort of plant based alternatives. So that's a long way of saying that. Um, you know, the plant-based meat alternative, uh, you know, market is not going to have as big of a, 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 share, a shift change in um, food supply chains as quickly as I think we, um, you know, were originally anticipating. But we'll continue to, to watch that. Yeah, topic number two is General Mills seems to be handling its supply chain issues well. And maybe one of the themes here in CPG is these traditional companies seem to be outperforming uh, kind of the more experimental, uh, you know, companies uh, you know, as consumers, uh, you know, try to tighten their budgets a little bit, you know, given that uh, inflation is, is so high uh, in food, specifically inflation is, is I think the last month it was 13 and a half percent. A lot of categories are a lot higher than that. When you think of things like, you know, eggs and, and, and butter, those are way, um, you know, above the, the, the average. But, you know, General Mills, I think we're all familiar with, with that company. They uh, reported last week around a little bit of an off cycle. They were able to um, you know, post strong earnings actually re- took up their guidance for sales. Was, was expecting up four and a half to five and a half percent. Now expecting up six to seven percent for the fiscal year. They pegged their cost inflation in that fourteen percent to fifteen percent range. I think they're going to have something similar with pricing, um, but still they're saying significant year over year increases in raw material, labor, freight, and fuel. Even though fuel costs have come down. Still, they're a lot higher than they were, um, you know, a year ago. That still translates into cost pressure for CPG companies. Similar thing with freight. Most of the CPG companies uh, purchase their freight under contracts. Those take longer to, um, you know, change versus the spot market. So these companies are still facing uh, headwinds on their financials from 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 freight. But you know, really, sort of the bright side for General Mills is um, their elasticity. So this it's the change in consumer behavior for for volume relative to price. Though that that behavior has changed less. Those those elasticities have been lower than um, than the company would have expected or um, the company has seen uh, during uh, other the other periods. So that was a positive thing. And then the other uh, real positive thing is the company seems to be gaining market share in most of its categories. They said that they've been taking share in 66% of, or, or products that make up 66% of their U.S. Uh, sales. And a big part of that is that the on-shelf availability has um, been better than that of its competitors. I know that Kellogg is one of the main competitors, at least in cereal, and they have struggled more than uh, General Mills has, has, has struggled with um, you know, having the, the products on the shelves. Part of that was 
uh, you know, strike. There was a fire at one of their plants, um, you know, a number of things. But um, that's been a big issue. So even with, with General Mills sort of ad- admitting that they've had greater supply chain challenges than they, than they typically have, you know, issues like not knowing when trucks are going to ar- arrive, not knowing if they have enough ingredients for certain products, that um, they still seem to be taking share based on having fewer uh, supply chain uh, issues. You know, topic number three is it does seem like Costco is taking retail share. I think that's pretty intuitive, uh, given that consumers have to cut costs uh, somehow. But I th- thought they posted pretty impressive results. Sales up 15.2 percent in in the, in the quarter that they just reported last week. Same store sales up 15.8 percent in the fourth quarter at their U.S. locations. Said there's no specific plans regarding a fee membership fee increase. They, it seems like they don't think this is the time. Even though if you check their watch, it's been five and a half years, and that's typically when they would do it. They also said they're keeping the price of the all-important hot dog and soda combo at $1.50. I know a lot of people are fans of of, of that. Um, we like to have a cheap uh, lunch, but that seems to bring people into the stores. The other thing that brings people into stores is the fuel offering, and even though fuel prices are down quite a lot from their high, I think a lot of people really got in the habit of f- filling up at Costco when fuel prices recently, um, you know, were at their peak, and uh, that's been, uh, you know, keeping people, you know, at the stores. This renewal rate, ninety-two point six, was actually thirty basis points higher than it was in the previous quarter. If there was one sort of caveat in the Costco results, is that their total inventory up twenty-six percent. That's a pretty big number, not as big as the numbers we've seen for inventory from Walmart and Target. And it's not entirely clear how much of that twenty six what that twenty six percent is just higher prices. Um, assume that's from a cost you know basis uh, accounting. So that's that's based on you know what they were purchasing it for. But let's let's say maybe half of it was uh, inflation. Um, still shows that inventory is a little bit of an elevated uh, level. Maybe not as bad as uh, some of the other uh, retailers that do a little bit that, that have um, you know larger number of, of SKUs. So um, what that means for CPGs is I think uh, a lot of these big box retailers, I think a lot of the discount uh, retailers are going to have a bigger presence in consumers, um, you know, uh, market share and consumers budgets. Uh, Topic number four, uh, this is always interesting to me. uh, Activist investor uh, Jana um, reported that it has a 10 percent of stake in in Fresh Pet. I guess this was in the Wall Street Journal. So um, that's enough to have a, you know, really kind of a, a lot of influence over a company. So Fresh Pet, if you're not if, if familiar with that, kind of a company that I thought was silly when I first heard about it, but um, it seems to be a trend. So Fresh Pet offers high-end refrigerated pet food, um, you know, with things like, you know, vegetables and, and fruits, and it's probably a lot uh, better food than most humans eat, um, and it's for your pets. And, um, you know, like a lot of other CPG companies, you know, Fresh Pet has struggled with inflation, seen margin pressure there. Um, You know, they've seen their uh, market cap contract, not as much as I was talking about earlier with uh, Beyond Meat. Their market cap went from about $8 billion to about $2 billion. And this uh, Jana Partners um, believes that Fresh Pet could be an attractive target for a larger CPG company, um, the acquisition target for a larger CPG company. I would have to agree with that, given what you've seen big companies like Nestle do, where they've divested a lot of the segments that are slower growth areas and uh, acquired uh, brands and companies that were in the faster growing segments. A lot of that has to do with both pet food and healthy food. And so they sort of think, well, this is going to be right in the wheelhouse for a, a big acquisition if they can sort of position the the company right. They also want to make changes related to capital allocation and, and operation. So it, seemingly, it, it looks like this activist investor, Jana Partners, if they can make the metrics look better, return on invested capital, um, maybe margins, it, it, they, they could um, you know, sell this to one of the big CPG, something like a Nestle or, or, or a, a competitor to, to Nestle. Uh, topic number five here is a CPG um, you know, acquisitions for the manufacturing capacity. And I thought this was was interesting. The the best CPG article that I read in the last week was in uh, Supply Chain Dive. And they um, you know, talked about how a lot of the um, recent acquisitions are really part of the value of recent acquisitions in the CPG space has been for 
the manufacturing capacity. And so there have been a lot of um, you know acquisitions there that have been different than you know what we traditionally think of as a CPG company acquiring another CPG company in order to have that brand. Um, it, but but a lot of it's been uh, to to have the manufacturing capacity. Some of the examples here was you know I've talked on previously about the, the Hershey acquisition of Dots Pretzels, where you know, Hershey of course strong in chocolate didn't have a pretzel you know component to that, didn't want to rely on a third party, but now they can you know, manufacture their own pretzels with the Dots uh, Pretzel you know, acquisition. Another um, example say was Hormel's acquisition of of planters from Kraft Heinz. Now they have that food manufacturing capacity, but um, you know apparently there um, is a shortage of a good food manufacturing um, facilities in the U.S., which is a big reason why the CPG companies have had to rely on third parties and use uh, contract manufacturing, which is a very expensive way to manufacture food. And, um, you know, you would really like to have a food manufacturing plant to sell, um, you know, right now. It would be, be easy to, to, to get a good price for that. So that's a little bit of the CPG news. Um, I would like to just take a moment to thank our sponsor again, which is RJW Logistics Group. Are you assessing the advantages of prepaid versus collect freight management for delivery into retail? RJW's retail consolidation program consistently achieves over 98% on time and in full to ensure a stronger shelf presence, increased in stocks, retailer compliance, and overall retail supply chain improvement. Visit rjwgroup.com to speak with a retail logistics expert about the advantages of RJW's program and to make the best decisions for your business. Um, talked about them the last time I did one of these stockout shows. We talked about the, the advantages of, of prepaid versus collect. You can learn all about that if you want to go back and listen to the previous um, you know, episode of the Stockout. Um, one of the, the uh, issues of the Stockout we, we wrote that went out, uh, just went, went out yesterday, uh, Tom, uh, Thomas Wasson uh, wrote it up. I'm going to put up a, a chart on uh, you know, peak seasons from FreightWaves Research, asking uh, various participants that, that we know, what are your thoughts on this year's peak holiday season for the freight markets? And the big takeaway here is that most people either thought that there would be a slight decrease in truckload volume or a significant decrease in uh, truckload volume. So about um, you know almost 30% thought there would be a significant decrease in truckload volume. About 35% uh, thought there would be a, a, a slight decrease. So about, about two-thirds are saying it's going to be lower. About 20% are, are going to be saying say it's about the same. And uh, in an increase, it looks like it's maybe another 15 or 20%. So it does seem like it's going to be based on what these freight companies, and they're talking to, to their customers and what their expectations are to move freight. Most of them are expecting a little bit less busy uh, season. This, um, this holiday uh, did also see a, an article just earlier today saying, I think it was from CNBC, that said uh, about 40% of consumers are expecting to spend a little bit less during this holiday season in light of the inflation. Um, you know, I think that makes a, a, a lot of sense. I also want to uh, toss up a chart um, so, so this is a list of the sonar um, data points that really stand out as having a big difference in the fall of 2022, you know, as they stand today versus the same day um, in 2021, sort of late September to late September. And, you know, you see there at the top, uh, the national truckload, you know, index, um, you know, down you know, 22 percent. So those are spot rates down approximately 22 percent. Those are per mile spot rates, you know, with uh, fuel um, included. Uh, we look at the, the outbound tender rejection uh, rate. Those are down um, you know, 80%. So it's gone from 25% a year ago. So um, carriers rejecting about one load in four a year ago. Now they're rejecting about one load in 20. And so it's going to be much easier for um, shippers to get their loads covered. And in those cases where they can't get them covered, they're not going to be as expensive on the spot market. So a big, a big difference there in terms of um, you know, getting the, the, the goods moved if you're a CPG company. The tender volume index um, is an interesting one. That's we're showing that down 24%. Now, that is influenced by the outbound um, you know, rejections you know, coming down because the, the outbound tenders includes uh, those tenders that are accepted and rejected, but it also speaks to there's there's less uh, demand coming from you know the retail sector and you know maybe the CPG sector as well. They are seeing some you know elasticity there. Um, so less transportation demand and you know a big part of that is is that uh, second one from the bottom, the inbound TEU volume index. So on the ocean, 
uh, we've seen a lot less demand there. That's down about uh, you know 48 percent um, based on ocean uh, tenders. So those are our bookings in, let's say, you know, China or um, you know elsewhere in Asia. Uh, you know. That, that are destined for the, the, the U.S. And so those tend to translate into either intermodal containers or, um, you know, truckload uh, demand. And so that's, um, you know, a forward-looking indicator that uh, there's going to be less, um, you know, transportation demand. And then, you know, retail, you know, diesel, you know, talk a lot about that having come down from its high, still up 47% year over year. So still at a really high level. So from the CPG company's perspective, they're still paying a lot more uh, for fuel. Um, I'll go to the next uh, chart here, which is the outbound domestic rail container of volume, which shows that um, you know we may or may not have a, a real traditional peak season in intermodal. You sort of look and see, well, what should be happening this time of year? Well, it should be ramping up as we get into the peak uh, intermodal season, which tends to be, you know, October tends to be the busiest month. In November, the last few years, has been really busy, actually, into December. Um, and you see this year, August just sort of flat um, across. You've seen a couple of dips down, one for, for Labor Day. And then this other one, I think, is related to the um, the strike, uh, potential strike, where Norfolk Southern actually stopped in-gating containers on um, that Wednesday. You know, even though it was um, tentative agreements released, released um, were reached on the Thursday, still, I think some shippers are, are trying to mitigate their exposure there. So I wouldn't be surprised to me if, if this doesn't have as uh, you know severe of a of an increase as, as you've seen in, in, in typical years. Um, the next uh, inter, uh, intermodal chart here I have is on rates. And this is an interesting one, too, because typically um, those rates, which these are, these are spot rates to move 53-foot containers door to door, those tend to tend to increase, you know, late in the year. You've seen in the last couple of years really, really increase. I mean, a lot of those those, those increases you see in purple and green were driven by um, sort of the major, you know, corridors, things like, uh, you know, L.A. to, to Dallas, where they it was capacity was tight. They didn't want to accept any of these um, you know, containers on the spot market. Now it's coming down. Uh, you know, part of that is is fuel off the tie, but you know, also that some of that is just I think an expectation from carriers. And these are these rates are set by the class one railroads that there's not going an expectation that there's not going to be as um, sharp of a of a peak season. You know, this year. So to me, this is a, an indicator from you know looking at what the the carriers uh, think about a peak season or maybe expecting a, a, a muted peak season. We have a chart on the ocean, which is the Freightos, um, you know, ba Baltic Daily Index here, which is a um, you know, measure of the spot rates to move from from China to the North American uh, West Coast in um, in white, uh, from China to the North American East Coast in in uh, orange, and you know, there's always a spread there because it takes you know, a couple of weeks longer to go through the Panama Canal to the U.S. East Coast. But that spread um, you know, goes up and down based on shippers' preferences. And right now, on the right, uh, is the spread. So it's the difference between those two lines. And you've seen the spread in increase you know, quite a lot. And that has been driven by shippers' preference to use all-water routes uh, to, from uh, China to the East Coast rather than um, what they call the land bridge option, which is to go through the West Coast and then use surface transportation. And, show, and so that's an indica indicator to me that um, there's gonna be less intermodal uh, freight, you know, all things considered, because much more of that freight that comes in through the West Coast, let's say two thirds of it goes intermodal, the fr freight that goes into the East Coast, maybe only 20% goes intermodal. Those are closer to most of the consumption centers. Uh, it also demonstrates that there's a lot in inventory if retailers are not willing to pay as much of a premium to get those goods to the consumption centers quickly, uh, which is, is also an indicator that uh, things are softening up a, a, a bit as um, you know, people cut back on uh, spending. I have a final chart here on intermodal contract rates. And what this shows is uh, 2022 is in white, 2021 is in green, 20. 20 was in blue. We've um, had two consecutive years of steep contract rate increases in domestic intermodal rates. Um, last year, 2021, you saw how they just increased throughout the year. It was almost like a step function up every quarter. Um, that didn't happen in 2022, uh, and we'll see what happens, um, you know, later in uh, you know this year. If there's not a true peak season, I think we get into 2023, and it could be the first year we've seen in a while where intermodal uh, rates 
fall from from the previous year. So shippers may see get some get some relief there on intermodal contract rates. Um, so that's really what I wanted to cover uh, today. I'm expecting um, more of a muted peak season than we've seen. And um, if you're interested in the CPG industry, would encourage you to go to www.freightwaves.com forward slash the stock out to sign up for uh, the newsletter, or you can just go up at the top under newsletters. It's the first one listed there, um, the stock out, try to get two of those out um, every week. So with that, I um, hope everyone has a great day.